sea, by the sea, by the beautiful sea, you and me, you and me, oh how happy we'll be, when each wave comes a rolling in, we will duck or swim, and we'll float and fool around the water, over and under, and good morning, hi I'm your host Harry Orgavon, and welcome to another episode of Our Lives, Our Future. We're presented by the Chula Vista Heritage Museum, the South Bay Historical Society, the City of Chula Vista, and the Chula Vista Public Library. I just got done using Dr. Bronner's hand sanitizer, lavender flavored, I believe, and uh, it helps keep us safe here along with our protective guard here. And this morning we're honored to have as our guest Don Johnson. We're down here at the Chula Vista Marina and we're aboard the schooner, the Bill of Rights. Good morning. Good morning, Harry. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I deeply appreciate it. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the schooner, the Bill of Rights, how you came to be a part of it uh, in this present day, and the different activities that are being performed on the schooner, the Bill of Rights? Boy, that's a tall question. We right. certainly can. The ship was launched in 1971 on the East Coast. Joe Davis was the owner and uh, Harvey Gamage was the builder for the ship, a famous uh, shipyard. She was launched again in 1971, so her 50th birthday is coming up next year, mm -hmm. next March. City of Chula Vista has proclaimed, or will proclaim, the month of March as a maritime month and we'll be holding events aboard the ship, birthday party, things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, in her early days she lived on the East Coast doing sail training for youth groups. Uh, she moved around until uh, about uh, late 80s and she came around the coast and worked on the West Coast. Worked her way on down until um, seven years ago when we acquired her. So we are South Bay Front Sailing Association, a 501c3 nonprofit, all volunteer. Everyone in the organization volunteer. is volunteering. Great. And typically they put money in as opposed to take money out. So it's a little bit of a unique organization that way. A lot of our purpose and mission deals with training youth. Uh, we do U.S. Navy Sea Cadets, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, mm -hmm. uh, a variety of youth groups like that. And we're reaching out more toward um, education to disadvantaged people. And the reason she's named the Bill of Rights is that she led the parade for the uh, bicentennial into New York Harbor in uh, 1976. Mm -hmm. So she was the lead ship in that particular parade and yes she operated on the East Coast for about 15 years mm -hmm. all the way up and down down into the Caribbean and so on and so forth uh, doing sail training for youth groups she came through and operated on the West Coast and we ended up acquiring her about seven years ago we're South Bayfront Sailing Organization Association and we are teaching kids training youth uh, such as U.S. Navy Sea Cadets, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, youth groups along these lines. So you're down here in the Bayfront and you're actually uh, working with the public to offer them uh, different types of tours. Uh, tell me about the different tours you offer. We do a variety of kinds of tours. They could simply be here at the dock going through the ship. In other words, just touring the ship at the dock. We do afternoon sales for a variety of organizations, and a few of those are public sales for two or three hours, where we go up uh, South Bay, under the bridge, maybe as far as the Midway and back. Mm -hmm. Then we'll do longer tours. The U.S. Navy Sea Cadets, as an example, will take out for a week. So they'll be out for five days uh, at sea. Uh, we will do charters for um, other organizations, nonprofits as well as for-profits. We will do a variety of charters, 
so it's custom tailored. So call us and, and we'll discuss your needs and we'll be happy to help you out. So what kind of things have you offered the public in the past? Well, we've done weddings aboard, we've done funerals aboard, we've done uh, <coughs> team building for uh, corporations. That's uh, the kind of thing that uh, we do well at. This, is, this kind of vessel, operating this vessel, requires a number of people working together. So it's an ideal team building exercise. So you've been involved with your wife, Susan, who's a board member of our South Bay Historical Society for a long time. Can you tell me uh, how you guys originally uh, came to know each other and uh, become partners in the Vessel of the Bill of Rights and uh, a little of that history, if you could? Certainly. We met here in this marina 31 years ago. We were both living aboard boats here, and uh, so we moved on from there. The vessel uh, was hauled at Marine Group. That's the local boatyard, an excellent boatyard. They've served us very, very well yes. over the years we've had the vessel, and for our private vessels as well. And uh, so we basically have been doing a variety of sorts of things here in the marina. We were members of U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary and taught all the classes for 30 years, power squadron, so on and so forth. This is another feature and expansion of what we're able to offer the community down here. So you mentioned the Sea Cadets. Tell me a little bit about that. What kind of things are you working with Sea Cadets, teaching them, and uh, what kind of uh, background do they need before they get in the Sea Cadet program? And Talk to me a little bit about that. Certainly, U.S. Navy Sea Cadets is sponsored and funded by the U.S. Navy. There's two different groups. There's what they refer to as the junior leaguers, which are 10 to 13 years old, and then the regular Navy Sea Cadets, who are 13 to 18, high school, if you would. Mm -hmm. They are organized a little bit like the ROTC, but a majority of the kids going through that program are going into the NCO program as opposed to officers. What we teach them is sailing tall ships, of course, which is a whole different process than power boats, requires a great deal of team effort, and that's part of why they're coming here, as well as the basics for navigation, those sorts of things. Yeah. So you mentioned the team <laughs> effort of a sailing vessel. Can, can you talk to me a little bit about what your team is and uh, what the different responsibilities for the members are on your vessel? Certainly, of course, starting with captain. I'm captain of the vessel and we have crew that operates and uh, manages the ship as we move along. One of the prime things is putting sails up. These are extremely heavy. There are only pulleys, there are no electric motors. So everyone has to pull up on the sails as a concerted effort. To raise the main sail, it takes basically five on the peak and eight on the throat to hoist the main. By the time we get it all the way up to the top, you're lifting 2,000 pounds by hand. Mm -hmm. So everyone has to pull their own weight and yeah. work together on that. Right. Uh, it can it can be serious if someone doesn't do it properly. Uh -huh. uh, as we're traveling, we're always standing watches. On this vessel, we need four people on a watch. Uh -huh. We don't have autopilot, so the person is driving the boat continuously. Mm -hmm. There's no automated mechanism to, to drive the boat. Mm -hmm. Because of the size of the boat, we have to have a bow watch, a person on the bow, because from the helm, you can't quite see everything in front of you. So we have a person stationed up there. Mm -hmm. We have another person on radar, and then one more person doing a roving watch. So they go through the vessel, verifying there's not water coming in, or a fire, or something along those lines. So uh, this vessel hasn't always had a motor. You more recently in its history, it, it uh, received a motor. What year did that happen? That happened in the mid 80s approximately. I'm not sure the exact year, but for about 12 to 14 years, 
she was operated strictly under sail. There was no engine that was installed later. It makes it a little bit of an interesting situation because of the way she's built, there's massive quantity of wood on the center line. Most engines and propellers are installed on the center line of the boat. It wasn't done that way on this one, it's offset to one side. So that makes handling under power an interesting proposition for those who operate boats. Uh, they'll understand what I'm talking about. So we're down here at the marina and I, I notice the tranquility of the area. I hear an osprey off in the distance calling out its call. And it's just such an inviting atmosphere for people to come down and enjoy. Now, everything seems quite authentic on this vessel. It's rather, it's a wooden vessel, I understand. And uh, it, it seems like people can come down here and enjoy this. Now, I've been here when pirates were manning the vessel. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Certainly, going back, yes, this is a wood boat built exactly the way she would have been built in 1850. The decks, the planking, the masts, the sails, all of the, all of the equipment aboard is very much authentic as it would have been in 1850. We do reenactments. There's a variety of uh, kinds of things that we'll do for periods, including pirates. Pirates have been sort of a popular thing. <laughs> Generally speaking, pirates are not very popular with captains of vessels for a variety of reasons. So what we refer to things at more than pirates is privateers. Uh, yeah. That was a semi-authentic kind of a certification for people to go out and take other vessels. Right. And they were actually hired by uh, different heads of state to privately work for them and to uh, Shanghai or rob the <laughs> uh, Spanish government of their wealth. That's, that's where the term came from. I that's believe. pretty much correct. They were <laughs> operating under what was referred to as a letter of mark, uh -huh. which was generally given by the king, if you would. And what it did is semi-limit who you could pirate from. Mm -hmm. So uh, if that particular country was at war with Spain, you'd get a letter of mark that authorized you to confiscate Spanish vessels. Let's put it that way. So originally, a lot of people don't realize, but Spain uh, claimed North and South America. And that stood up for a few years, but uh, later on, the different countries said, well, well, wait a minute. And so that's where the privateer aspect came in. So that's very interesting, Don, that you know all about that. So tell me about other things about the vessel that you'd like to talk about. Well, uh, <clears throat> this provides a great number of different uh, opportunities to learn things. Mm -hmm. Some of it is substantially artistic. Marlin spike is the process of working with lines, ropes, if you would, mm -hmm. and there are basic, very functional sorts of things that you do with rope aboard a vessel like this. But you also, in your downtime, can begin to work into a variety of artistic sorts of weaving. It's almost like uh, a crochet or something like that, yeah. only in a more substantial sort of form. So you will see decorative kinds of knots on the boat mm -hmm. that look good, but they serve a purpose. These particular Turks heads, it's a variety of a kind of knot, is put in place where the blocks would drop to the deck normally, so it provides protection both for the block and for the deck. But it's also very appealing. It's a kind of artwork, if you would. Sure, that's very interesting. I know knots are a very important part of sailing a vessel and the knowledge of those knots. So how many different knot varieties do you think we are using on this vessel here? That's a really good question. <laughs> How many knots are there? Thousands, thousands. literally thousands of knots. Ashley's Book of Knots is a great reference. Uh -huh. What we use on the boat is roughly eight basic knots. They're done in a particular way. Lines are coiled and hung in a particular way because what you have to remember is that if something comes up, let's say bad weather at night, hmm. the crew has to come up in the dark go to the correct spot, 
handle the line in a particular way to address that specific emergency. Mm -hmm. Well, if people are individually tying strange knots, that becomes a challenge under a tense situation. You mentioned you have multi-day trips. How many uh, days consecutive would you be going out in this vessel, do you think? We have gone out for as long as two weeks in one stretch. That was a cruise up to the Channel Islands with the executives of REI as a particular charter. Mm -hmm. This vessel is capable of going around the world. So depending on the number of crew and the distances, we could be at sea for a month easily. So talk to me about the educational component of what you're doing here on the Bill of Rights. Uh, are you working with different uh, school groups? And uh, what kind of adventures do you have available for them? Sure. Just last Friday, we had uh, a group of homeschooled kids through Soaring Minds. Hmm. They brought 10 kids aboard and spent two hours. And we broke them down into five different groups and did navigation. We did uh, Marlin Spike. We did um, what's, what's Marlin Spike? What is Marlin Spike? Marlin <laughs> Spike is the process of working with line. Oh. It could be as simple as tying a knot. It could get as complicated as doing a variety of sorts of decorative knots, putting together lines, eye splicing, things like that. So what other kind of thing? All right, well, we have to cook aboard. Cook. <laughs> so culinary, we oh. talk about how do you prepare meals. We have to cook for uh, 34 people, three meals a day, whenever we're out. Right. That's how many people we take on overnight trips. During day sales, in normal times, we can carry 88 people. Oh. We are a Coast Guard licensed passenger vessel, mm -hmm. so we have very specific criteria that we have to adhere to. Uh -huh. Safety rules and regulations, those kinds of things. Oh, you mentioned you're cooking on the vessel. Do you have a certain uh, cook aboard the vessel? A certain That'd be me. That'd be you. You're the cook, too. All right. You're, you're the captain and the cook. What other titles do you have aboard the vessel? Very good question. Generally speaking, these sorts of ships would have a hierarchy of you'd have a captain and some other officers aboard the vessel. At this particular time, we have a captain. We have a quartermaster, first mate second mate, bosun, who's responsible for a lot of the lines and maintaining a lot of the, the ropes in particular, but those kinds of things, bosun's mate, and then deckhands. Mm -hmm. Now, a minimum crew, according to the Coast Guard, is five, one captain and four deckhands. That's not enough people to handle this ship. Right. For overnight trips, we have to have two captains and six deckhands. That's still not quite enough. I prefer to have a minimum of 14 crew aboard. So you mentioned this is a volunteer type of situation. How many volunteers do you have in your group to draw to make that 14? Generally speaking, we have 125 members, mm -hmm. but as far as working crew, that's probably in the vicinity of 25. So are you still, are you always looking for interested individuals in our community to join your team? To help yes, you absolutely. Because there are a variety of things that need to be done, not just making the vessel go. Mm -hmm. There's maintenance on the vessel and we train people. Typically this sort of ship, nobody has any experience aboard a vessel like this. So my expectation is whenever I get a new person, even if they've been sailing for a long time, they haven't been sailing this kind of a boat. So we need to retrain, if you would, just for that. But we also have a variety of other positions and a bunch of different kind of help that's needed, including administrative, okay. bookkeeping, doing tours. Mm -hmm. We do have art, selling art aboard, these kinds of things. So there's room for everybody. So if you'd like to get involved with the Bill of Rights and Don Johnson, please contact Don and the Bill of Rights and you can be a part of this community. You also talked about doing marine biology studies on the vessel. Can you tell me a little bit about that? We'd like to develop that to a greater extent. We've purchased a variety of microscopes. 
we had a lady who was uh, who's who had a master's degree in marine biology but unfortunately she moved to the East Coast so we're looking for people who are a little more familiar with that I have a little bit of background in biology myself but uh, we would like to expand our programs there's a lot of sea life and bird life down in this part of the South Bay and we'd like to spend a little more time expanding on that. So what was the name of the person that dedicated those microscopes to you? That was K Surplus. Okay. This is a surplus uh, company down in National City that we okay. acquire a lot of materials from. I know a lot of people want to get involved. What kind of things do you see that the community could either donate or fund or help you out with that you have needs uh, operating the vessel, the Bill of Rights. Thank you. Um, the list is virtually everything. The scenario is if we can't use it on the boat, potentially we could go ahead and sell it, if you would, and generate some revenue. The kinds of things that we're doing aboard the boat right now is we're in the process of restoring her. One of the obvious areas that needs work is our deck. Mm. That is about a $150,000 project. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're looking for is donations of wood, materials, and of course, outright donations of funds is a big help. We do most of the work ourselves, and we always need more help of skilled carpenters, skilled mechanics, these kinds of things. But even if you don't have a high level of skill in these areas, we'll teach you. We can help use your help. Mm -hmm. well, that's great, Don. One of the things that I personally have looked for in this particular environment is for this sort of organization and vessel to be a center of the community, mm. to be a rallying point where people can come, spend time, visit with each other, look at history, look at heritage. That's what this is about. She's a historical vessel. We're trying to operate her in a historical uh, venue, if you would, as much as we can. And as a ship, you're a world all by yourself when you're out at sea. Mm -hmm. And you need to figure out how to get along. Even if you're not the best of friends, you still need to figure out how to get along. So as a community center, that's part of my goal. We would like you to come and be involved. And it's so tranquil down here at the waterfront. It offers the opportunity to get in touch with nature, the habitat, the wildlife, the environment, to breathe, the clean air which is Chula Vista is known for its clean air and its beautiful view it's very important uh, what you have to offer here Don with the Bill of Rights so with this opportunity to come down here uh, you invite the public into your family it's this great experience of the Bill of Rights generally speaking we end up with people coming in either through acquaintances in other words personal knowledge or simply walking by and we invite them aboard to go through so the intent is to offer the opportunity for people in this community to participate in a relatively unique scenario this is not something that's commonly available to people even the museums downtown are something of an arm's length because of the nature we're looking more for people to participate and come aboard freely and actually involve themselves in the vessel to a greater extent than most other places offer. Well, that's great, Don, and people will have the opportunity they can take from the experience on the Bill of Rights, a living museum, and they can uh, offer their uh, abilities to participate in this great experience, which is here today for our generations and generations to come. What is the most incredible thing or craziest thing that you've ever experienced on this vessel? Well, one of the more interesting things, <laughs> let's put it that way, because of the nature of this particular part of South Bay, we have to operate in a very, very narrow channel because outside of the channel, there's insufficient water to float the boat. So what makes things exciting is parking this vessel Typically, we do that under engine power as opposed to sailing. Well, on three separate occasions, we've lost our engine for a variety of reasons, 
and we have ended up sailing this vessel back into this slip. Now, you're essentially committed at that point. You have no options for backing up or changing your mind. You have only one way you can go. And so that gets a little tense. Getting her parked that way is probably what I'd say is the most intense thing for me. Our sails are old and we typically have scenarios where those will tear when we're under sail. That gets a little exciting. We have to shorten sail, things like that. And I want to emphasize Maritime Month, March of 2021. What we will be doing is creating a seafront 1850s shanty town. Oh. We're going to have coopers. We're going to have blacksmiths. We're going to have cobblers. We're going to have uh, corkers. We're going to have sailmakers, shipwrights. We'll have a variety of people in period costume demonstrating cooking of the time, selling wares that would apply to that. We'll have displays of artifacts, if you would. So that's coming up, and that's one thing that I would dearly love to have more help with, more people doing that sort of thing. Well, that sounds really interesting. So the public and community can look forward to getting involved with that, and that comes in March, you said. That is correct. That'll be the 50th birthday of this vessel. Oh, wow. She was launched in March of 1971. Yeah. So what is a Cooper? I've never heard that term. What is a Cooper? <laughs> Cooper, Mr. Cooper. Yeah. Barrels, Coopers kegs. <laughs> I'll bring you one and show you if you wish. Okay, sure. I'll be yeah. right back. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, so coopers would manufacture barrels. They'd also work on wagon wheels, these kinds of things. So doing staves and hoops, the blacksmith would prepare this part. The cooper would be shaving these particular strakes, the parts of the barrel that go together, uh -huh. and then putting it all together. Why are barrels so important to a sailing vessel? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's what you put things in. It's sort of your shopping bag today. But that's how material is stowed on the vessel. Typically cargo is put in barrels. Could be dry goods, could be wet. So depending on like a wine keg as an example or some sort of hard tack. Everything that's stowed on the boat is typically stowed in something, and in many cases, it was barrels because of the way they could be sealed. So that's very, very authentic, how everything keeps to the authenticity of the vessel in its era. I noticed you have a cannon over there. Uh, tell me, We actually have used? four cannons four. aboard, and uh, this vessel participates in what are called battle sails. So, uh, when we attend festivals of sail, in many cases, a number of ships will go out and fire cannons at each other. Oh my, wow. So are those like reenactments of yes. different battles? I know well, <laughs> let me rephrase that. It isn't that organized. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we're not doing a particular setup, making the same moves that a given battle had at any given time. We're making it up as we go along, trying not to run into each other, but trying to get close enough to put on a good show, if you would. Uh -huh. So do you go out on the 4th of July and experience the fireworks on the bay? Yes, we do. Typically, that is our very best event. We fill the boat. We have 88 people aboard the vessel when we go out for the fireworks. And we park in the bay and literally have 360 degree fireworks. So Don, this is really exciting. We're just sitting here on this part of the vessel. Could you take us on a tour of the vessel? Yes, let's oh, go on a tour. Excellent, let's go. Okay. Let's start on the bow. We'll work our way aft on the deck. Then we'll go below decks and I'll show you that part of the ship. All right, normally this part of the boat isn't quite so cluttered, but we've been doing a fair amount of work here. And so we have some materials and things in place. But this is a schooner. We have a bowsprit. We have three headsails. We've got a jumbo, a staysail, a jib, and a jib top. 
typically I have to end up out at the very end of that thing when we're setting or striking that sail, which makes life a little bit interesting. <laughs> Moving back, we have three anchors aboard. Anchors are used to hold the vessel fast when you're not sailing and you don't have a slip to go into. So on this side is our small anchor. This particular anchor weighs 350 pounds. That's the little one. Wow. Our main anchor is on this side. It weighs 600 pounds. Then we have a storm anchor buried under here that weighs 800 pounds. Typically, we never use this one, and I hope never to use that one. So, so how do you hoist it overboard? Is it manually Good picked up? Good question. <laughs> As I had mentioned before, everything aboard this vessel is done through team efforts. We have something referred to as an anchor burden. It's a hook and block and tackle that we lift that anchor with. We untie it, we lift it, and we lower it down into what's called the cat head. That's that piece of iron that has a piece of chain on it. So the anchor is hanging. We'll pull anchor road out and flake it out on the deck. When we get to the spot where I want to put the anchor, then we'll release that, the anchor will drop, then we'll back down on it and set it. Well, this takes somewhere in the vicinity of 20 people, especially when we're bringing the anchor back aboard because we have to haul in the anchor road. Generally speaking, we'll set up a block and tackle that'll hook to the road and we'll use 20 sea cadets operating in almost a bucket brigade fashion, hauling on that rope to bring the anchor up. That's incredible. It's a process. It takes <laughs> us hours yeah. under some circumstances oh. to bring the anchor back aboard. Yeah. All right, so this is the foremast. Now, one of the characteristics of a schooner and particularly a gaff rig schooner is that they have a boom, that's this lower piece, and a gaff, which is the upper piece. Because of the way the gaff is, generally speaking, we're not able to use what are referred to as backstays to stay the mast. So the shrouds are doing it, and in order for that to work mechanically, the mast has a fairly aggressive rake. In other words, it's leaning back more than typical modern boats. And that gives schooners that specific kind of look. So this mast, is that one piece of timber? That's one piece of timber. It goes down below, you'll see where that is when we go below decks, and then on up. Uh, we've got 120 feet from the water to the tip of the main mast. So which is the main mast? Okay, that's another characteristic of schooners. We have the main in the back, and the foremast is forward. Most two-masted modern vessels are called catches or yawls, and the main mast is forward and it's taller. Schooners, the main mast is aft, and so it's the tall one in the back of the boat. So what type of wood is the mast made of? Masts are typically made out of spruce if you can get it because, depending on how much you know about wood, as trees grow, they tend to twist. Spruce does less of that. So as spruce dries, it doesn't untwist like the other trees would, if you would. So these masts are spruce, you're saying? Yes. Uh -huh. oh, very nice. The boat was built in an American tradition. It was oak for frames, oak for planks, and they had yellow pine back east, and they would use yellow pine and spruce, those kinds of things. So it's an, it's an American tradition, if you would, American wood. Moving on back, this is a typical example of what we refer to as pin rail. You have belaying pins. You see those in all the fancy movies where they pull them out and hit people with them. What they're for is to attach lines. Now, uh, You've heard the phrase, show him the ropes. This is what they're talking about. Because theoretically, when a crew is well-trained, in the middle of the night with the boat pitching, they should be able to come to a particular point and handle a particular line once you know what you're doing. So showing them the ropes deals with how you handle all of these lines.
How many different lines do you have here? You know, that's a real good question. <laughs> Hundreds. <laughs> Hundreds of lines. We'll put it that way. All right, let's cross through here at this point. This is some of the modern materials that we have aboard. These are life rafts. So we can accommodate 60 people in life rafts. Now, theoretically, when we're at sea, we only have about 34. So there's a little bit of redundancy there. But this is part of the safety equipment we're required to have since we're a US Coast Guard license passenger vessel. We have to comply with that. So is this the main engine here? Oh no, this is an auxiliary engine oh, auxiliary. that serves three purposes. Yeah. It works as a 32 volt generator. It works as our fire pump. This is a wood boat, so one of the critical things is you don't want to burn the boat. So okay. this is a fire suppression system. Uh -huh. It also has some additional valves to take water out of the boat. Okay. So it can either suck seawater in and uh -huh. use it to put out fires, or <clears throat> if we're taking in water, we can set it to where it will draw water out of the boat and put it overboard. So you mentioned water. Uh, you have to have fresh water on a vessel when you're out at sea. So you have a storage capacity for fresh water? Yes, we do. We store 400 gallons of water uh -huh. and 400 gallons of fuel. Wow. Is there a particular kind of fuel you would use on the engines in this vessel? Diesel is what we're using for this particular auxiliary engine and our main engine. Uh -huh. Our small boats, of course, use gasoline for outboard motors. Uh -huh. We're going to travel back and we'll go down okay. the main companionway. Okay. There are a couple of other things we'll look at on the way by these particular things everyone is interested in. They have questions about, what's this? Yeah. This is what's called a dorad, and it's for ventilation on the boat. Now the problem is, when you cut a hole in the deck, if you get water aboard, it goes right through. Well, this is a system to prevent that from happening. Oh. So there's a pipe that goes up, water can go past it, but the air circulates and gets below through here. This is what's called a pin rail at the base of the main mast. We talked about the pin rails at the foremast. These serve the same kind of function as the others do, just they're operating different lines. Okay. Are these past crew members here? <laughs> That's left over from our Halloween event, nice. yes. <laughs> so this is one of the lines that we use to hoist the sail. This particular line lifts the peak, the end of the gaff. So you can pull on that and get a sense for how much it takes. Oh yeah. 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 So I put five people on this side and eight people on that side to wow. hoist that mainsail. Wow. You have to be pretty healthy to be working on this boat. Right now. Well, <laughs> uh, most of us are actually somewhat advanced in age, I'll put yeah. it that way. Okay. There are a lot of us that are actually veterans, but uh, I kind of tell people our average age is somewhere around 68. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> but we're always looking for more people, younger people in particular. Uh -huh. Love to have more younger people. Sure. Pulling in unison, following commands, working together. Mm -hmm. We have a little bell here. Does that serve a purpose? This one is the ship's bell. We have another bell on the bow because we're so long. We're required by maritime law, if you wouldn't have rules, to have the ship's bell and the forward bell. So tell me about the bells. What, what do they do? What's their purpose? What do they designate on the vessel? Generally speaking, in the old days, if you would, and if we managed to get below at either the hour or the half hour, our ship's clock also has chimes. You ring the bells. Watches are four hours. And typically, every half hour, you would get a ring. So the, as the watch starts, you'd have one bell 
And then as the watch ends, it goes all the way around through four hours, ringing every half hour. And eight bells signifies the end of the watch. Okay. Our osprey leaves us gifts. <laughs> All right, this is the ship's wheel. This is where we steer the vessel, here. So you're actually at the back of the boat, it's, unless you're going in reverse. If we're going in reverse, we're going that way. But yeah. yes, typically as you're driving the boat, you're back here uh -huh. all the way forward. That's, again, why we have to have a person on the bow uh -huh. keeping a lookout to pass information about something we might be about to run over. All right, now this might be an interesting thing from a historical perspective. I'm going to lift this and show you the gears that are used. Harry, if I can get you to stand here, sure. and you can operate the wheel when we lift this. <laughs> oh, wow. This was cast in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, and this is a traditional style of gearing. Now back in 1850, this would have been very modern, but it was definitely done in those time periods. So go ahead and turn the wheel. Okay. Turns now, quite easy, actually, I'm surprised. It I'm, does. I'm turning the rudder at this yes, point? Yes, you are. Oh. This is the rudder post right here, uh -huh. and you can see it moving. This is an indicator, and you can tell where the rudder is pointed, either visually looking at it or at night when there's no light, you can tell by feeling that indicator. Incredible. I imagine you have to keep it lubed up real good. I yes, we do. Yep. There, huh? Now this ship weighs 127 tons. There are a lot of forces going on, and this mechanical advantage is what allows an individual to easily steer this vessel. I'm impressed how uh, easy it is. It's, it's just like nothing. It's like it's easier than steering a car, I'll put it that way. Yeah, <laughs> it certainly is. Or a kayak. <laughs> yeah, or, or a kayak. And generally speaking, we have, when the kids are aboard, they're standing a watch. They're driving the boat. Wow. They're the ones who are here at the wheel steering a course. So let me show you the compass. So do you, do you mention uh, younger people would be steering the vessel. Do you have to have a, any kind of a permit or special training to have this post, in a sense? The scenario is that aboard this ship, I'm the captain, I'm the official officer, and I can have other people doing tasks aboard the boat uh -huh. under my supervision. Okay. Now, to operate boats in California, they've started requiring, I'll use the phrase, licenses. So they're operator's permits for operating a vessel in California waters these days, mm -hmm. other than a captain's license. Right, that's a new thing that's... Relatively new, it's yeah. been going on for a few years, but not many. So actually, if you became a part of this community, you would have the opportunity to actually be here where I am. Absolutely. Steering the vessel, the, the schooner, and the Bill of Rights. You would, you would certainly be there because we have to rotate everybody through it. Oh, you rotate. Standing there for a long period of time becomes tiring, yeah. which is bad enough, but your attention tends to wander, which is really bad. We want you focused. Yeah. So typically I'll circulate people through half an hour to an hour on the wheel at a time is about it. Then someone else will take over. Really okay, let me show you the compass. Okay. Trade your places here. Compass. That's, this sounds important. <laughs> Only if you want to get where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is very much a traditional piece of navigational equipment that goes back many hundreds of years. Compasses have been used as far as steering a course at least in the 1600s and probably further back than that. Very, very basic, traditional piece of navigational equipment. Uh -huh. So you have a compass, do you have a barometer on this boat? Yes, we do, and I'll show you that. Okay. It's next to the ship's clock. Okay. It's a nice compass for sure. That is. So you keep it protected. Uh, this keeps the sun off of it, oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the card doesn't fade and the liquid doesn't go opaque. 
So that provides some protection. All right, now as we go below, this is a ladder, not a staircase. So generally speaking, please turn around and face the ladder as you go down and their hand holds. So going through this way and holding on, their hand holds here and here. All right, so at this particular point, this is a navigational station. This is the barometer. This is the ship's clock here. Uh -huh. Now, would the ship's clock be different than a normal clock? Generally speaking, uh, they're considered a little finer timepiece. They're referred to in many cases as chronometers hmm. because this is a critical component in navigation hmm. as you're doing, and I'm going to move forward a little bit here, as you're doing shots in order to determine your position, you'll have to take time into account in order to be accurate. Oh, wow. So when you're using a sextant, uh -huh. which is a very traditional means of fixing your position at sea when you're out of sight of land, when you take that particular shot, the specific time has to be accurately recorded in order to make good determinations about your position. Okay. Now, when you're using the sextant, is it uh, the North Star you still use to... That is one celestial body that you could reference, although the deal with the North Star is it's a fixed position mm -hmm. and a given for locating north. Generally speaking, for these purposes, you would use other stars and primarily the sun mm -hmm. as a point of reference. So the sun, the moon, the planets, and stars, such as Orion. Orion has sufficient stars in it spaced far enough apart to where you can take shots on that one constellation and determine a fix from that. So uh, you mentioned the barometers up here too. Can you tell me uh, what the barometer's purpose is and how it functions on a ship as this? Certainly. What a barometer is, is a drum that's sealed, that maintains a given pressure. As the atmospheric pressure changes, that drum swells and contracts, moving a needle. So that will give you an indication of falling pressure or rising pressure. Which one are we most concerned about? Falling pressure. Why? Because that indicates the weather is changing, usually for the worse. So a falling barometer indicates a potential storm coming. So we have a tendency to watch that carefully to make a determination of what's going to happen in the near future and prepare for it. So how long a period of time would that give you before the storm actually hit? <laughs> That's a great question uh -huh. and it completely depends. There are fast moving fronts, slow moving fronts. So the rate of change also gives you an indication of how soon are things going to get and how severe is it going to be. Generally, if you're having a rapid drop, usually that indicates a great deal of wind about to happen. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's very interesting. Because I know when you look at tides and their relationship to the high tide and the low tide, how quick they will come. It oh, yeah. has a lot to do with currents and things like that. They'll generate currents, yes. Uh -huh. This is one of the small books that are produced for tides. So you would find out when high tide is, low tide, and how high and how low the tide is going to be. So yeah, all of that comes into the process of. Mm -hmm. So are these some of the things you're teaching yes. the individuals? Yeah. Yes. That's very interesting. Okay. Oh, and what, what do we have over here? What is this? This is very artistic, is it? Are these knots? Or? Yes, they are. Now, when we were talking about marlin spike, this is a form of marlin spike. This is referred to as a monkey's fist. And generally, it's a solid object inside. Back in the old days, it was a lump of lead. <laughs> and this line is wrapped around it. 
and attached to it. What these are typically used for is heaving lines. Oh. You notice our dock lines are substantially large. Because of the weight, you can't throw that very far. Mm -hmm. So if you needed to extend that further, you would attach a light line to it. This, you can heave 50 to 60 to 70 feet and then attach the bigger line to it and they can pull the big line in. So monkey's fists are typically used on heaving lines. Mm -hmm. Who made these particular ones right here? Well, I didn't make these particular ones. They were made by, I think Robert Strange made no, these. Uh, Doc made them. Doc, okay. We've got a, he's also our blacksmith, huh? gentleman by the name of Doc Pierce. Oh, you have he a made this one. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's great. Do you teach kids these particular things? Yes, we do. This is part of what we teach. Now, again, Marlin Spike covers a whole range of and this is beginning to get into the, let's say, lower intermediate skill range. Uh -huh. Still fairly simple and relatively straightforward. And yes, we teach that. It's very interesting. <laughs> there are so many different aspects to uh, this particular selling vessel and the things and uh, your teaching and opportunities people would have to contribute. That's really interesting, Don. Sure. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. This is our main salon. And we can seat 28 people in this particular uh, area here. Mm -hmm. This is where we serve meals mm -hmm. and generally where the snacks live. Mm -hmm. So uh, where would the restrooms be in this particular restaurant? We have no restrooms. We have oh. what's called the head. Oh, the, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> now why do they call it the head? Why do they do that? Well, mm -hmm. it's the head because it's at the front of the vessel, ah. the forward part of the vessel. Why is it at the forward part of the vessel? <laughs> well, in the old days, when you were sailing a ship, where did the wind come from? The, the back of the boat, the <laughs> blowing that way. Ah. So for the captain's sensibilities, the restroom was at the front of the boat. Okay. So let's, on the way, show you the engine room, and then we'll get to the bathroom. I see. The head. The head, yes. Okay, so this is the engine room. Are those the bells? That's the bells. <laughs> okay. Yes. So we have a Caterpillar 3208. That's our oh. um, main propulsion system. Uh -huh. And then we have an 8KW generator in here. And that was put in the vessel in what year again? In the mid 80s. Mid 80s. Uh -huh. Okay, and then down here we have the galley. That's the boat name for the kitchen. Okay, so we have a six burner propane stove uh -huh. and the other amenities hot and cold running water, those kinds of things. So, what's your specialty down here when you're the cook? Well, uh, generally the menu for the week would start out, the breakfast is typically the same. We have bacon, sausage, pancakes, a uh, variety of potatoes, either O'Brien's or hash browns, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Um, pancakes, I don't know if I mentioned that, maybe waffles. Yeah. We'll do biscuits and gravy and oh. those sorts of things. Yeah. Lunch is generally a little simpler, a soup and sandwich kind of thing. Uh -huh. Then for dinner, we'll vary, we'll have roasts, We'll have pork roast, beef roast, we'll do a chicken dish of some kind, we'll do stews, we'll do lasagnas, and uh, those kinds of things with the typical rice, peas, corn, uh -huh. salad, bread, yeah. that kind of thing. Wednesday, I'll typically cook apple pies, and we'll have apple pie for dessert. Wow, that's really neat. So I know when you're working hard on a vessel, food is very important. You always look forward to the meals. <laughs> Hopefully they look forward to the meals, yes. <laughs> and yes, they're very important. Uh, generally speaking, when we go to sea at first, uh, we'll usually have something a little lighter for the evening meal. We might have a stew of some kind. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. I know it's very, I'm surprised I can really breathe good even though we're down below. Sure. Yeah, so that's yeah this vessel is well ventilated. She yeah. actually is quite good. <laughs> now... Uh, is the vessel a feminine 
description of the vessel? Generally, generally speaking, we refer to ships as she instead of he. I have no idea why. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't know where that started from, but it goes all the way back. And this window? Yeah, okay. if you'll go first. Okay. Wow. This is a watertight bulkhead, and this is a watertight door in the bulkhead. Wow. Why is that important? Well, that keeps the water from going all the way through the ship. Oh. We have five separate watertight compartments. Mm -hmm. Any one of them can flood and the vessel won't sink. Oh, okay. That's, that's very important. Yes, it is. <laughs> so this is what we refer to as B compartment. We sleep 10 in this particular area here, and we have one of the heads here, which I'll show you. So we have two cabins, two per cabin here. Mm -hmm. We have two open bunks here. Mm -hmm. And then we have what's referred to as the quad. There are four bunks over here. So this is what's referred to as the head. Okay. All right, so moving on through into what we refer to as A compartment. Now one deal, uh, U.S. Navy Sea Cadets are co-ed. So when we have Navy Sea Cadets aboard, because they're anywhere from 10 to 18 years old, this becomes officers and female quarters, and this portion here is male quarters. So in through here, we can sleep 16. The shower is here, since you asked about that. That's in this compartment. Okay. So do you have smoke detectors? Down yes, there? we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that we have to comply with. Yeah. It's right there. Oh. So yeah, fire, of course, is a big deal. We're always interested in uh, preventing that and addressing it if for some reason it uh, happens. So one of the members who is part of the watch, their purpose is every 10 minutes to go through the entire vessel We'll look in the bilge. So this is a bilge here. We'll show you that part. All right, so down in there is the bilge, and they check to make sure we're not sinking. So the water level would change change down there? Or? Yes, water does come in a little bit at a time. Okay. So the good news is we're sinking very slowly. Gotcha. Yeah. And we do have some electric pumps that will run occasionally mm -hmm. just to clear that out. Mm -hmm. But this is normal for a wooden boat. Yeah. Okay, now we go forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's go around this way. <coughs> this is one of our companion ways, which is an emergency exit for this compartment. Mm -hmm. We have another emergency exit forward. This is that mast that we were looking at. So it comes through the deck mm -hmm. and is what's called stepped on the keel. So the mast goes all the way from the keel all the way up. What area of the world would they be growing this type of timber? Spruce happens in quite a few areas, northwest and of course back east. Mm -hmm. Canada, those kinds of areas. Colder weather usually, Colder. higher elevations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Really nice. So this is really incredible, Don. The uh, Bill of Rights here. It's very fascinating. All the different aspects of it, and the opportunity to participate and uh, available for anybody in the community uh, by getting Definitely. in touch with you and uh, the Bill of Rights, and uh, they can experience these types of things. And it's on a volunteer basis, and that's. They're Absolutely really incredible. We don't have a lot of opportunities in the community to uh, participate in these kinds of things, but this is uh, definitely a golden opportunity for uh, our community to participate in. Thank you, Don. Well, thank you. Yeah, we certainly, certainly want to preserve a bit of history here and teach the skills and the trades that it takes to keep this alive. And the more people that are involved, the more it helps us. Physical activity, donations, anything along those lines are deeply welcomed. Mm -hmm. I always take everything so slow. Well. And so she went down to the beach and said, Barbara, that's the best.
Don, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to us about the Bill of Rights and the different things you have to offer. So we'll put up information for you so you can get in touch with the Bill of Rights and Don Johnson here. Ahoy, mates! So now what do we care? I love to be beside your side Beside the sea, beside the seaside By the beautiful sea